I've been on the island a couple days, and people have been saying, "Oh, you're going to give that talk about cybersecurity, about securing the internet." And that is my business, and that's kind of what I'll talk about. But I'm not going to talk about any technology. I'm not going to talk about the specific ones and zeros, or or tell you to turn the computer off and then on again. Although that always works. <laughs> I want to hit the more TED topic of saying the internet and cyberspace, which is the internet plus. All that other stuff that we've connected to it—that this is an environment, just like the air or land or the sea—and it can get polluted, just like the air, land, and sea can. And then we have to start thinking about it differently and sustainably if we want it there over the long term, because we all know how the internet and cyberspace has changed our lives. We all have our own personal stories, and you'll be hearing them all the time at TED and TEDx, of how the technology has been there to make things completely unimaginable to previous generations. And it's not just our personal lives that it's changing. A couple years ago, McKinsey, the consultancy, found that over 20 percent of GDP growth in developed economies was coming from the internet, and that was in 2011. Just think. About what it's doing now, but unfortunately, it's under threat. Now, I'm a computer security person, so I'll be talking about computer security threats, of crime, espionage, warfare, malicious hackers. But I'll only touch on these briefly. So, when we're talking about crime, there's certainly been plenty of headlines in the past year. Very trusted companies. Have been hit, and tens of millions of us have had our information stolen. There have been many headlines about espionage, and it started out with hearing about how Chinese military were breaking into companies around the world to steal information that would then go to Chinese companies that would have competing businesses, or American spies, one of which I used to be, breaking into places around the world. For national security reasons, and what we were told, especially in Washington D.C., we would always hear, "Ah,、oh, everyone does it. You're overreacting. Everybody does this," as if that is somehow supposed to make us feel somehow safer or more secure. The internet's also been used for warfare. Estonia and Georgia were hit by patriotic hackers. Associated with Russia, the United States did a large-scale attack against the centrifuges of the Iranian nuclear program, and actually destroyed them. Pretty much made them pop. Now, of course, I can understand. I'm a national security person. I can understand why that makes sense, and to do all of those things. We know we live in a dangerous world, but sometimes, perhaps, we're living in the moment too much, and not looking out too far. And many of the people that you'll see on stage today or at other TED events consider ourselves hackers in some way or another, whether attacking computers or fabrics. And I go to hacker conferences quite a bit. And when I go there, I see these people that do these fantastic, curious people that take things apart and try to make them do what they want. But sometimes they also go too far. And I'll see talks about people that say. We want to be able to break the encryption on mobile phones, so that we can listen to any mobile phone con conversation that we want. And moreover, we want to make this so simple and cheap that a ten-year-old could do it. We want to take what now NSA can do, and we want to democratize that in the name of privacy. Again, I understand the rationale, but perhaps we have to look at the longer-term implications of what we're doing. Because the internet, the cyberspace, is probably the most transformative technology since Gutenberg and the printing press. Okay, I'll grant you electricity, flush and toilet, both pretty cool. 
we'll call it one of the top four. One of the most transformative things that has ever come from the human brain. And in fact, if it hasn't already, in the next couple years, it might certainly surpass the printing press and be the most transformative thing our species has done since the wheel or fire. But imagine if 20 years after Gutenberg, it turned out that the Pope, the petty princes of Europe, pretty much anybody that cared to, could know exactly what was being printed, exactly who was printing it, and exactly to whom it was being passed. Now, maybe we would have arguments about whether that violates civil liberties or how this is an offense to privacy. But that might be missing the larger point. And we could argue about whether it was constitution or legal, but that might be missing the bigger picture. Because if you don't trust the underlying communications technology, we would not have had the Renaissance or the Enlightenment. I simply don't see how they could have possibly occurred if you couldn't have trusted that underlying communications medium. And this is, I think, the situation we are in today that our generation is facing, that our generation and those one or two before us invented it, and we might be the last ones to truly enjoy it. The conversation now is in this balance between security and privacy and liberty. I think it's actually a battle between security and resiliency, making sure that it stays up, of the internet itself, of cyberspace itself. And because we have taken the internet and cyberspace and we have connected it to everything, almost literally everything, not just our phones, but increasingly our cars, our dams, our electrical power systems, and even our own bodies, with embedded medical technology to make sure we stay alive. It isn't just against the internet. It's about the future possibilities until the end of humankind. And I mean that literally. Until the end of humanity in this universe, and there are no longer members of our species, we are have this moment now with this most transformative technology that we may be the last ones to fully enjoy. So how many renaissances or enlightenments might we be foregoing if we continue to treat cyberspace as a place for crime and espionage and warfare and malicious hacking? What will we in our lifetime and our kids and their kids be missing out on? Now, there's good news and bad news here. The good news is that we as defenders, we're getting better. Day in, day out, those of us that work in cybersecurity, we're doing a better job. We're missing birthdays, <laughs> we're working weekends, we're inventing new stuff, we're deploying new technologies, there are more of us crowding the field, we're training the people coming out of universities, and we are definitely getting better over time, without a doubt. The bad news, is that the bad guys not only have the advantage, the easier time, but they've had the advantage, not quite from day one, but certainly from day two. And if we're like this, they're like this. They're getting better, faster than we defenders are getting. And you all experience this, right? It's easier to take home a piece of technology and plug it in than to be able to secure it properly. Oh, God, am I supposed to update this? What's this window saying? Who knows something? Find someone with glasses. <laughs> and what's worse is the bad guys might not be getting better like this. They might be getting better exponentially. Right? And how many systems can stay in equilibrium when day after day, year after year, decade after decade, because they've had the advantage for over 30 years. How long can that stay before you hit a tipping point where there's more predator than prey and where 
no longer do we think about the internet as value creation and the joy we get from it, but it's actually more about value destruction and something that we no longer really want to deal with. Where our grandkids say to us, oh my gosh, what was that like, the, the era of free internet love when you could put personal information about yourself where others could see it? Where you could shop online? That's crazy. But we have this myth that it's always going to get better, and it doesn't have to be that way. So if we get past this tipping point, what might it look like? Fire or ice? So to me, the future of fire is instead of just having the, experiencing these as incidents where, oh yes, did you hear that company got hit or this other place got hit and they took our credit card. We experience it like we felt 2008 in the financial shock because one thing goes down and it takes out something else and it takes out something else. I mean, imagine if one of these gl global cloud providers, one of these technology companies that's too big to fail has a Lehman Brothers moment. It's there with all of our data on Friday, and it's gone on Monday. That's not an incident that we can easily model or think of, but just think of all the dominoes that that would take with it. And now, we can barely think of that in 2014, of what the implications are. What's it going to be like in 2016, or 2026, or 2066? Or maybe this future might look more like ice, and we're not experiencing these crashes, we just slowly forget that what the promise was supposed to be. And we have to tell our kids about what a cool place the internet was, that it was something that brought so much joy to so many lives. So if you're thinking your kids or grandkids are going to have a cooler, safer, more resilient, more awesome cyberspace than you did, we really have to examine that, about why that's going to be true. Moreover, we have to make it true that they will do. And you can think of all these other times we've had this with technology, right? I mean, our parents' generation or their parents, they thought everybody was going to have jetpacks. Right? You were going to have a vacation on the moon, or even Mars, because that was the natural trajectory of that technology. It was a straight line from the fantastic place we are, and you extend that forward, and we're going to be up there, and you're going to be able to take that vacation on the moon. And afterwards, it turned out, you know what, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. It was too expensive, it wasn't worth it, it wasn't that interesting, maybe it was too dangerous. And now we look back at it and we giggle a little bit. Ha, 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 where's my jetpack? Ha, ha. But there's a natural direction to technology that seems natural at the time, and it doesn't come about. People remember in the 1990s, digital voting was going to be one of those things. I remember reading books that were talking about this and saying, we are going to have a truer democracy, the kind of democracy that the that the Greeks had and the American founding fathers had. And we can use our home computers and we can participate in this democracy and it'll be rich and we will more truly be ourselves. And you know, we're probably never going to have that. That's a jetpack of the information age. Because if you try and vote online, there's always going to be someone there trying to take it down. At least if you try and do it on a larger scale. So what can we do about this? So if the problem is that the attackers have an easier time than the defenders, O is greater than D, then the solution has to be to flip that around, right? To get defense better than offense. Or even better yet, to get defense way better than offense. So I think for those of us here, we need to be thinking about, we need to put a time frame when we're thinking about the internet. How can we make sure the internet isn't just what it, we want it to be today, but it will be that way forever, for as long as we can make it? So to do that, we have to believe that defense can get better than offense. 
we have to care that our actions will affect others. That just like you should pick up the litter you see on the beach because it affects everybody, that you need to take care of your computers and your networks because it will impact others. Others will take over your computer and use it to impact everybody else. <laughs> this is a tough one. We have to wait when there's new technology. We have to wait for that to come out securely. Because right now, the companies are on a rush. They want to rush to market, because we all are demanding it. And then they'll add in security afterwards when they know it'll be a different, then it'll be an important product. And of course, we need to demand that security so that we know they're taking our privacy and they're also thinking about that longer term. And of course, we have to act. And we don't always know how to act to make our computers secure. Patch your systems. Make sure that when it says, I've got a new version of my software, make sure you load that. Make sure you're loading some kind of antivirus software. And there's other things that you can do. It's National Cybersecurity Awareness Month in the US. There's tons of information coming out um, on staysafeonline.org. Now, it's a slightly different message for governments and companies. They have the same things that I mentioned before, but for them, they need to commit. Commit not just the bottom line today, but be thinking about how we can make the internet sustainable. Microsoft did this in 2002. Bill Gates stood down the company for a couple days and said, we're just going to all learn about security and make sure we're coding, that we're doing our software as secure as we can in institute new practices. I come across some companies um, today, like uh, the Japanese company NTT, that has made a commitment to commit the resources to try and make the internet more resilient. Governments, especially the big governments, have to decide on their priorities. Does the US government primarily think the internet's going to be a great place for the exercise of national power, of hard national power, of espionage or attacks? Or is it, as the president has said, really a place that makes us more truly human and aids our economy? So I think, of course, we have to put prosperity first and foremost if we want the internet to be there for our kids and grandkids. So thank you for your time and thank you for your commitment to help keep the environment as clean as, we can, as it can, the air, the land, the sea around us, and also the internet around us so it'll be there for our kids and their kids and theirs after that. Thank you.